Hello, and welcome back to our study of the book of 2 Corinthians. You remember the last time we began looking at chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, we observed several interesting things there. First of all, we looked at the word fellowship, that is a partnership or a sharing in giving. The Thessalonian brethren didn't have a lot of money, uh, but they gave abundantly out of what they did have uh, because... They wanted to have partnership in taking care of the needs of the saints in Judea. We further noted that Paul said they gave themselves. If you start with giving yourself, then everything that you have uh, also is already given to God effectively. Uh, then he, he used the Macedonian Christians as an example, a, a stimulating example. Their giving should have challenged uh, the church in Corinth. He talked also about the giving of Jesus, how that he sacrificed everything in heaven to come down to earth to die for man. And then he urged them to live up to their commitment. They'd already made the commitment a year ago. And now Paul says, I want you to live up to it. Do what you said that you were going to do. I want to go further with this idea of giving and all that it involves. But before we do that, I hope you'll consider accepting the opportunity to take a free Bible correspondence course. Gospel Broadcasting Network offers a free non-denominational Bible course. It's based strictly on God's Word and not the creeds or traditions of men. Why not contact us for lesson number one? Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight. You may want to enroll by email. The address is info at gbntv.org. To enroll by phone, call us toll-free at 888-805-3390. All right, let's go back and just reset the stage by rereading, beginning at verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who is also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind." Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Here's something that we may not always realize. And that is <clears throat> that, that we are God's representatives among people. That when you and I walk on the earth, we are representatives of Christ. And so, of course, we ought to please Christ. He's, he's the one we work with. He's the one we work for. But we also need to please men. They need to see us as being honorable. When I say please them, that's what I'm talking about. Show them you're honorable. Show them that you live up to what is true and right and just and fair. All those things ought to stand out uh, as we go forth in service to the king. That's what Paul was trying to do here. He has multiple men coming to take up this collection. He's got multiple men going with him to carry the collection to Judea. All of that is so that they'll be right in the sight of God, but also they'll be honorable in the sight of men. So verse 22, And we have sent with him our brother, whom we have often proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. And now here's a third brother. 
Uh, we know Titus. His name is given. Uh, the second man apparently is a, is a great preacher, one that has delivered the gospel to many people. He's well known for what he's done. And now we have this third man. And this is one who has, has proven to be a diligent worker in everything that he does. You know, if, if you were asked this, which one do you want? The talented but lazy worker or the slightly less talented but constantly diligent worker? I know my answer. I want that diligent fellow. I want that fellow that is going to, to stay at it with everything that he has until the job is done. Yes, the talented fellow might be able to finish more quickly, but the diligent fellow will get the job done and he'll get it done right because of his diligence. And that's, that's what we see here. Paul says, I've trusted in this fellow again and again, and he's grown in his diligence because of that. And now he, that confidence motivates him to come diligently to you as well. So then he goes on. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner, my fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. All right, first, uh, if, you, if you want to ask about these fellows, let's start with Titus. Uh, Titus is my partner. He and I share in the work. Boy, what a statement. I mean, obviously, Titus is the younger man. Titus is described in other places by Paul as his son in the faith. And yet, he says, he's my partner. Uh, you and I would view that as, as an equal, and that's the way Paul viewed it. He also says he's my fellow worker. And specifically, he was Paul's fellow worker in regard to the church at Corinth. And so if anybody's asking questions about him, really the church ought to be able to say just what Paul said. Oh, yeah, we know Titus. He's Paul's partner. Well, that should have been good enough. But in addition to that, he's been a fellow worker. He's labored with Paul right here in Corinth. And we know him. We appreciate him. We love him. But then what about these other two brethren? It's interesting that it says they are the messengers of the churches. And the word is apostolos, uh, apostles. Uh, we, I, I fear at times, think of, of, of words way more specifically than they really are. So we say the word apostles in reference to uh, the New Testament and we instantly are thinking about the 12. Well, of course, they are apostles. They were sent by Jesus on a great mission to carry the gospel to all the world. But it goes, that word can be used in other places. Uh, it could truly be said when a mother says to her child, would you go to the store and get us a loaf of bread and bring it back home? That child is his mother's or her mother's apostle uh, sent on a mission. So Paul says, if anybody asks about these other two fellows, just tell them that the churches who've already taken up a big collection, that those churches sent them as apostles. They're their sent ones. They trust them and therefore the church in Corinth and the people in Corinth ought to trust them as well, for they are doing what they do to the glory of Christ. The reality is, of course, that Titus was as well. Each of these servants is trying to glorify the Lord, and that's Paul's message of commendation. They ought to trust each of them. So then he goes on in verse 24 of chapter 8, Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love, and of our boasting on your behalf. Uh, demonstrate to them that you really do love, first of all, God, of course, but you also love the body of Christ, the church. How are you going to prove that love? Well, it's pretty easy. Just go ahead and give that gift that you promised. Go ahead and give generously so that everybody will know your love. Now, 
That is one of those rare spots in Scripture where we might initially scratch our head and say, we've got to, we've got to prove ourselves by the way we give? And the answer is, well, yes, we do prove ourselves by the way we give. We prove that we love God. We prove that we love Jesus. We prove that we love the body of Christ, the church. All those things are seen in our giving. So Paul says, let these brethren see how much you love God and you love the body of Christ. So chapter 9 rolls right out of that when he says, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. Uh, you already know about the need in Judea. You already know uh, of the importance of serving the Judean Christians by giving like this. So Paul says, really? It's not necessary for me to write about that. For he goes on, For I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. I, he says, Paul says, I don't need to talk to you about the need in Judea. You already know about that. In fact, your response to that need I have used over and over and over again. I tell everybody, when Achaia heard about what was going on in Judea, they said, we want to give to help those brethren. And Paul used their commitment to spur others on to greater giving. That is a marvelous thought that our giving can spur others on to give as well. So he goes on, Yet I have sent the brethren lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready. Paul is trying to avoid, in a sense of the word, embarrassment, a, a dual embarrassment. First of all, an embarrassment for them. He's been telling everybody everywhere, these brethren made a commitment a year ago. Uh, they are great givers. They've got in mind to really help those brethren. Secondly, Paul doesn't want to be ashamed of himself because he's been doing that boasting. He's been bragging to other people about how the Achaeans have made their commitment uh, to give toward this matter. So he doesn't want them to be embarrassed. He's sending these men ahead to be sure that the gift is ready when he arrives with the others and they all go forward with the total gift to carry it to Judea. So he goes on in verse 4 and explains what we've just been talking about. Listen to him. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Paul's not certain, I guess, whether or not anybody from Macedonia is going to come with him, but if they do, he has bragged about them so much, he wants to be sure that the gift is already there. It's already ready and present so that both he and they will not be ashamed of the boasting that he had done. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Now, when you think about it, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, you actually see the arrangement that Paul had uh, in reference to this giving. He said, beginning in verse 1, As I have given order unto the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. On the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. All right, they made a great commitment. Uh, how easy would it be for you or me right now if somebody came up and said, could you give $2,000 to help a, a bunch of needy people? How easy would it be to just snap your fingers and say, sure, just let me write you a check. 
Well, I don't know about you, but I couldn't do that. On the other hand, though, if you said, we need $2,000, would you help with this? I might say, well, sure, I, I can give the whole 2000 if you'll let me set it aside a little bit at a time. If you'll give me time to accumulate the money. That's the arrangement that Paul had and had commanded in Corinth. Give every first day of every week so that uh, it'll be in treasury when we come to pick up the collection. Now, so that they don't have to feel forced into it, Paul is sending these brethren ahead so that it, it can be made sure that the collection is thoroughly put together and ready to be received and taken on to Judea. That's the purpose that he has in mind, at least at this moment in time. He goes on, in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now let's think for a moment about a farmer. And let's imagine that this farmer is, is living a little bit tight right now. Uh, things are not so good. It's time to, to put the, the uh, crops in the ground. It's time, time to plant the seed so that later we'll have a harvest. And so the farmer begins to think, and he thinks, you know, if, if instead of using a, a, a hundred pounds of seed, I just use 50, it'll be a lot cheaper. Well, that's true. It would be a lot cheaper. But what about the harvest? If you only use 50 pounds of seed versus 100 pounds of seed, how, how many stalks of corn, for example, are going to end up coming out of the ground? Well, I can almost guarantee it's going to be less. Why? Because he cut back on the seed. He cut back on how much he put in the ground. And because of that, he doesn't have as much coming up out of the ground. And therefore, the harvest will be smaller. So Paul says... The one that sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Now, what should the fellow do? Well, if he's got more acres to plant on than he normally plants on, instead of putting in 100 pounds, he might want to put in 125. Use more land. Why? Because 25 more pounds means that much more crop growing up that many more stalks coming out of the ground, and therefore, that much greater harvest. So Paul says, look, when you think about giving, that's the way you need to think about it. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. The truth is that God rewards us according to our giving. If you go back to the book of Malachi, uh, we find what I think is the only instance in all of Scripture where God asked men to put him to the test. Listen to Malachi chapter 3, uh, beginning of verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Now stop a minute. They didn't give very well. And God noticed it. So what does he go on to say? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. God says, you just test me. Give bountifully. And see if I can't outgive you. As one man put it, God's shovel's bigger than ours. And I think that's a pretty good description of what we're talking about. So give bountifully to reap bountifully. God will do that for us. Now, verse 7 of chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. First of all, be reminded that we are to purpose in our giving. We are to, in advance, 
decide how much we're going to give. Now, some people don't like to talk about purposing in their giving. They say, well, it needs to be a free will offering, so I need to, I need to do it on the spur of the moment. I find that intriguing if that's what people are saying. And here's why. If I go out to buy a new, a new car, it may be used, but new to me. If I go to buy a new car, uh, don't, don't I, generally speaking, and in my case, I'll have to say yes, don't I normally borrow money and plan to pay so much a month to own that car? Well, the answer is yes, I do. We purpose all the time. I purpose in order to buy a car. I purpose in order to buy a house. I may purpose in order to buy other things as well. When you use that credit card, the bill does come due. That's the point that I'm making here. So purposing to give to God is not a bad thing. It shouldn't be viewed that way. We purpose for just about everything in life. But notice this. He doesn't want it to be grudging. Purposing makes it a, a willing offering. You pre-plan it. You willingly give it. And it's not grudging. Instead, God loves a cheerful giver. One author that I read saw this word cheerful. And he looked it up in the original language and he said it, it literally could be translated hilarious. God loves hilarious givers. Well, uh, can you imagine giving with just pure laughter in your heart? Just about any uh, grandma or grandpa probably can, and even moms and dads can. When we give gifts to people and it pleases them, it, it causes us to just beam all over and, and laugh with joy. So that's the kind of giver that God wants us to be. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Some people don't give because they say, if I give generously, I won't have enough to pay my mortgage. I won't have enough to pay for my car. I won't have enough for my children's education. Paul says uh, effectively what Malachi said, test God because you're going to find that he is able. I love that word. He has the ability, the ability to do what? To make grace abound toward me. I've got to say that God has always been gracious to me. I've always had enough to eat, enough to wear, a place to live, and lots of good brothers and sisters, a great spiritual family to encourage me and support me in the work that I do. God is thoroughly gracious to us, and He will always help us with, notice this, all sufficiency. With God, you're not going to be able to say, uh-oh, we came up short. Didn't have enough. I'm reminded of Jesus uh, the five loaves and the two fish and the feeding of the 5,000, was there sufficient for everybody? Well, the answer is obvious. Of course there was. In fact, everybody ate to their fill and there were 12 baskets full left over. That's the way God does things. That's the way He does it. So He has all sufficiency in all things that we may have an abundance for every good work. Now, we can do this good work at Corinth, or wherever you and I are, and we'll still be able to do another good work when that one comes along. So he goes on to say, as it is written, he is dispersed abroad, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. This comes from Psalm 112, verse 9, and the idea is that God blesses us so that we can give to others, and in turn, uh, we can, can once again be blessed so that we can give to others. It's a beautiful idea. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now, Paul is saying, here's my prayer, that the good gift that you're giving now that's going to help the brethren in Judea will in turn abound to cause other people to be blessed. And isn't that the way it works? 
many farmers who, uh, who plant seed will s used to at least save out some of the harvest seed so that next year they'll have seed to plant. And they plant that and it brings forth another harvest. So Paul's image here is that this gift, when it is sent, is going to do good and it's going to spring up and do good for other people as well. So that the gift just, in some ways, keeps on giving. So verse 11, While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. You've been enriched. You've, you've liberally given. And guess what happens? Thanksgiving to God grows. And he continues, For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. It's not just that, that saints are getting to eat because of the gift that's being sent. There's something else that comes out of this, not just food to feed the hungry Christians, but also thanksgiving. And most important here is the fact that the word thanksgiving or thanks many times incorporates within it a part of that word for grace. So we receive God's grace and we give thanks to Him for that grace. And that's the message that Paul is delivering here. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. They're going to give praise. They're going to thank God for what you've done. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Uh, those brethren are going to want to get together with the Corinthian brethren. They're going to want to tell them how important they are to them and how special they are because of the gift that they have given. But now, Paul doesn't want to close out this idea of giving without going to this last great statement. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. The old King James has unspeakable. And that really is not a bad translation if you understand what they're saying. I don't have words to really tell the greatness of Jesus' gift on Calvary. His death was remarkable beyond words. What He did for me, what He did for you, is great beyond any ability that we have to express it. Paul says, give, just like Jesus did. And remember all the time that you've received the greatest gift of all, the gift of salvation that was offered at Calvary through the death of God's own Son. Be my